It is a lovely sword, observes Emiko, of the sheep death order blade, similar to Victor's plasma falchion, on a stand in the shop we're passing time in. If you think it's lovely, why didn't you buy it? asks Jenny cheerily. I just... well, it would only be an ornament, and really, I have enough ornaments. I'll leave it, she decides. Fair enough, Jenny shrugs, before turning to Fan and Sue. It's about ten time you two got together. It couldn't be more obvious you two are into each other. Who asked? Fan's cheeks flush, and the Suigu, receiving a piggyback from him, her legs melted into a ring around his waist, grins over his shoulder. I initiated things. Cuckoo was being a scaredy cat. She squeezed under my door, chuckles Fan, half under his breath. Do you two need to get moving? They have to be nearly there by now, says Messiah. The Shing's head's over his shoulder. I turn my eyes out of the circular window at the front of the shop, to the enormous forested spire that looms over Xing De Deng Feng, and see Victor, Brunhilde, Tun, Zong, Kaz, and Fran walking on a path with a sheer drop to their right and a sheer cliff face to their left. There's still some distance from the top. I say we have around 30 minutes until we need to head to the shuttle. Incredulously, Petrikov steps to my side, looks in the same direction and says, You can see them. I can see them, I confirm. With your bionics right? asks Krish. I frown, bring my left wing up to cover my artificial eyes and look again. No, I can see them with my natural eyes as well. Well, my main spectrum eye, at least. At this distance, the humidity in the air is swallowing the heat signatures. That's incredible, observes Hunter Thiele. Emiko smirks. You know, all of you, you could stand to be a little less shocked when a garden warder demonstrates an ability that exceeds that of a human. It can come across as arrogant, as if you believe that humans ought to exceed non-humans at all times, in all things. Everyone, except the shop attendant, Emiko and I, has a moment of looking embarrassed before Emiko looks out of the window and adds, That is very impressive, though, with an appreciative smile. Shi Dao Yuan's Perspective It's quiet, but I hear the shuttle approaching from the direction of the valley below. As I sit, playing my Erhu on the steps surrounding a courtyard in the temple, I found it half a century ago. I briefly catch a glimpse of the shuttle over the roof to my left before it sets down. I don't interrupt my plane, letting the mournful notes continue to echo across the courtyard. A few minutes pass before my best student, Shi Shi Wen, comes to me and says, Shifu, they're, they're here. The ones who wish to take you... Still playing, I answer. Thank you, Abbas. Please show them in. I retired as abbot around ten years ago, but continue to reside and teach here, where it was definitely the right woman to seek control to. When the ODR contacted this temple, saying they wanted the galaxy's finest martial artist to be a fitness instructor of all things, I very nearly responded that they should just visit a gym if they wanted someone to lead Quigong and such with uninitiated individuals. The detail that two students in my lineage are aboard this ship, as well as several others proficient in arts other than Shaolin, had changed my mind. I'm still not certain I won't send someone else, one of my students, not Wei of course, but someone from the 65th or 66th generation. It depends on how they perform. A Japanese woman and a Rakwali woman with prosthetics enter the far side of the courtyard. The Japanese woman has schooling in Kyujitsu, Kenjutsu, Jujitsu, and Iatsushu from childhood, and then served in the military, excelling in standardized military CQC there. The Rakwali has been schooled in Rakwali military aerial combat and ground combat. She was good, but hadn't practiced in some time. I'd guess since the war. That's him? He doesn't look particularly impressive, the Rakwali woman asked the Japanese, having correctly determined that I am not wearing a translator and, incorrectly, concluded that I am out of earshot. Don't I? Well, appearances can be deceptive, I answer in fluent Rakwali, just loud enough to allow my voice to carry over my plane across the courtyard. The Rakwali woman freezes and begins to stammer in embarrassment, but I interrupt, It's all right, ma'am. If you are a prospective student, it will be another matter, but I take no offense at how lovably you've just underestimated me. The two women approach me, the Rakwali still visibly embarrassed, the Japanese doing a much better job of concealing her embarrassment. The Japanese woman kneels in a dogeza, and Rakwali, following her lead, 
Force her natural and artificial legs beneath her, nestling into the ground. Finishing my tune, I put down my instrument and his bow and take out a translator, adhering it to my temple. Even if I speak both of their first languages, it would make things difficult if only one of them could understand me at a time. So, you have students for me? I addressed the Japanese woman. Yes, Shifu. They're on their way up the mountain now. They should be here shortly. I smile. You don't need to call me Shifu, ma'am. Not unless you wish to become my student yourself, which I take it you don't, given your method of arrival. She nods politely. I assume you know how bad it will look if your prospects are on that shuttle, and are now hanging back to make it seem as if they walked up the mountain. Don't think I won't be able to tell, I say with an amused smile. I believe you'll be satisfied by the condition they arrive in, Daiyuan, nods the Japanese woman. I'm afraid the two of you have me at a disadvantage. Might I ask your names? Emiko Miyazaki, responds the Japanese woman. Takwal, responds the Makwali. A pleasure to make your acquaintance. She don't won. You are already aware, I smile. Just then, into the courtyard, into two 67th generation Jalin practitioners, an East African boxer, a Dushwain soldier, a woman whose species I don't recognize, but who's clearly had schooling in historical European martial arts from childhood, and then practiced full-time for some years in a Taoist art, I think Bagu Zhang, and a star-born woman who is an utter cacophony of competing arts, but whose underlying basis, I would say, is... Bateriect? They have clearly walked up every one of the 25,158 steps between the town below and this temple. The enormous copperhead Brit and the even more enormous, though wide and deep, rather than tall, orange-haired Neanderthal, will be instantly recognisable as the students of my students' students. Even if I didn't know them from both having served as unwitting walking advertisements for Shaolin for fourteen and five years, respectfully. The uptick in interest we got after the British Shaolin status became public knowledge was measurable. Likewise, when the Neanderthal divulged her status in an interview. Most weren't serious, of course, but who's to say how many practitioners there are today as a result of these two? However, as I said, even if they weren't already known to me, I can read my influence in the way they carry themselves. It's always slightly uncanny to see so much of yourself in one you've never met. Nebret, Neanderthal, and Taoist practitioner of undetermined species perform a uh, Bao Quan. The Taoist actually performs too, Placing the knuckles of her upper left hand against the palm of her upper right, and reversing the arrangement for her lower arms. In all of my years, this is the first time seeing a multi-armed species perform that respect. The boxer, soldier, and starborn hesitate, before copying the salute. I beckon them forward and gesture for them to take a seat with the two women I was talking to. Shiro Min, Shiro Fang, it's a delight to finally meet you, I address the redheads. The honour is ours, Shifu, responds the Brit, turning his eyes to the ground in respect. Then the Anderhol nods agreement. The blue-skinned Taoist is looking at me, slightly confused. I know why. You have a question, Bagua Zhang? I smile. Her luminous eyes widen and her cheeks flush a purple colour. I'm sorry, Shifu. I meant no disrespect. But you're wondering why I'm not bald, I chuckle. She looks away, abashed. I bring my hand to my long hair, tied into a neat bun at the back of my head, and laugh. When you're the galaxy's finest martial artist, you get a bit of leeway in how you keep your hair. None of my students have raised it as an issue. No need to be embarrassed, girl. I'm not offended. She smiles, clearly still worried. Now, I look at the assorted perspectives. Who's first? Do you need time to recover? I don't mind if you wish to eat, drink, and rest before we start. Forgive me for interjecting, but I thought this was a simple assessment. What exactly are you starting? Asked the Raquali woman. The Parmé test cap. When those already schooled to a high level in Shaolin or other styles want to study under an even higher master, there can be some arrogance carried in. The test is meant to make us humble. We've got to try to strike him and he'll only dodge and parry, not strike back. If we touch him, he bows down and calls us master. We won't, though. I'll go first. I carried water up the mountain with me, and I know it won't make a difference if I rest or eat, answers the Brit, concealing the roughness of his accent. 
I understand he thinks he's being respectful, but I shall have to have a talk with him about authenticity. If I'm impressed enough to accept him as a student, that is. He speaks with some humility, though. I can tell it's fresh. He must have had some illusions shattered recently. I don't know why I was expecting tea in a chat, chuckles the Raquali. Of course it has to be trial by combat, when deaf old warriors are involved. I smile at her. Tea can be provided, if you wish. We'll have time to chat, later. I'll survive without tea, sir, she smiles back wryly. Turning my attention back to the Brit, I begin removing my weighted van braces and place them down, allowing them to make just enough noise to hint at their mass. As I do so, I shall test you first then, Roaming. Then, addressing the others, would all of you be so kind as to watch from the stoa? He and I shall need some space for this. The five prospectives and two others clear the courtyard and take position together, watching from the covered walkway surrounding the open space. He was right to put himself first. He's definitely not the strongest, that distinction going to the Neanderthal, but he's the one who looks least exhausted from the climb. The blonde starborn, Tashwani's shoulder, and the boxer being a close second, third and fourth. The Neanderthal and blue-skinned Taoist have clearly suffered due to their ancestral lack of stamina. I have to say, I'm impressed a garden warder was even able to make the climb, let alone keeping pace with this group. Coming down the steps, onto the courtyard, I am struck by the Brit's height. He has to be 18 centimeters taller than average, and 28 centimeters taller than me. He's bulky, too. Not that I'm worried he'll actually manage to hit me, but if I stood still for either him or that the Underthought woman, if I let them get a clean strike, there's no doubt they'd seriously hurt me. We bow, and he takes an aggressive stance. I take a defensive. Were he less well trained, I would take no stance at all. However, that would be arrogance here. Begin! I announce. He lunges forward with impressive speed. He aims an open palm strike directly at my face. He's almost as fast as me. However, where he has to cover all the distance between himself and me, I only have to move my head out of the way of his strike. Reacting before he even would have landed his blow, he tends to redirect my new position. My left backhand meets the inside of his wrist, batting his arm harmlessly away. There's no doubt he's earned his black sash, but... Well, I would definitely say his skill has suffered from the best part of a decade of not having any appropriately skilled sparring partners. He's regressed, somewhat, to thinking of Shaolin as an external martial art, lashing out, ferociously, to try to cause damage. That's true at lower levels, but at higher levels, it becomes internal, focused less on striking and more on avoiding and redirecting. The opposite is true of the Taoist arts, Tajiquan, Bagashang, etc., we start out internal and then, at higher levels, become external. Though the highest level of both Buddhist and Taoist arts is recognizing that the distinction of external and internal is meaningless, the same way it is to the uninitiated. My prospective student aims a sweeping kick at my legs. Of course, with his stature, it makes sense that he would favor the northern style. Not like the Neanderthal. She has southern boxer written all over her. Not wishing to remove myself from the ground, I ought to block it with the bottom of my foot, rather than jumping it. I'd say he favours a Dao style sword. A little longer. Custom made. Straight backed. When was the last time you meditated, Ming? I ask. Causing his punch to falter, allowing me to dodge it easily. Um, been a while, he says, while aiming another blow at me, recovering from the falter. I can tell. That won't stand if you're to be my pupil, you'll realise. Yes, Shifu, he says, more focused now. Forty minutes later. The Brit lies gasping on the ground, soaked in sweat and utterly incapable of continuing. He was much better than I thought he'd be, but still wasn't close to passing the test. Done? I ask, standing over him. A pleasant sheen of sweat on me, but not out of breath. He shakes his head, still gasping too much to speak, and makes to get up. I like your tenacity, boy, but you're done, I chuckle. Sure enough, the strength in his limbs fails, and he falls to the ground. I hold out my hand, and he grudgingly takes it, and allows me to pull him to his feet, feeling that bulk of his. I show him to his friends, who have been dutifully watching, as we thought. I place the knuckles of my right hand against the palm of my left and bow, a gesture he returns before collapsing. I'm still undecided. I mean, he was good, but I definitely think there are 65th generations at the temple who could instruct him. 
Let's see what the others have. One hour later. The soldier had some speed and a deceptive amount of stamina given her slenderness. She lasted 14 minutes. The star bomb was definitely the most chaotic and unpredictable given the rough, utilitarian way she's ripped bits she's deemed useful from a hundred different arts. So just her criminal background, but she's clearly reformed, if so. She lasted 18 minutes. The boxer was good, with her upper half. Her training, however, views the legs as little more than a platform for moving the arms around. Her attempts to kick were a little pathetic. She lasted 12 minutes. The Neanderthal was the best by hair, but it's clear she is not used to taking the offensive, compensating for her lack of ability to read intentions by simply reading mechanics and reacting. Very clever, but useless in this context. Unless she wanted to just stand there forever, waiting for an attack that wasn't coming. The raw power contained in her strikes was unnerving. Even to me. That stamina, though, really let her down. Seven minutes. Fighting, or rather being fought at, inside her climate control field was quite refreshing. I was beginning to get a little hot. Now for the garden water. She certainly has some skill from the way she carries herself. I hope she doesn't disappoint me. As it stands, I certainly think I'll be sending one of my senior students on this mission. Much as I hate to pass off the opportunity to learn the martial arts of a new Deathwatch species, there simply isn't enough skill among this lot to keep me engaged for that long. It was so close, too. Ah, it's probably for the best. I hardly doubt he'll allow me to take Queen Long, and there's precisely zero way I'm leaving him behind. As the four Undaoist approaches me, I am about to offer her the handicap of only using one hand to parry her strikes. Then, her limbs whip into a Bao Kwan with speed and grace that were definitely not present when she arrived, exhausted earlier. I reconsidered that handicap. This woman deserves more respect than that. I return her salute, and then announce, Begin! She's on me! The speed! By the Buddha! I fought four armed species before, where was this coordination then? If I had given her that handicap, I would already have lost. Knives are her weapons of choice, it seems, from her strikes. Each blow has a pathetic amount of power, but they're so fast, in such harmony. Her glowing eyes are flying over me, searching out any weakness. I've not felt this much on the back foot for decades. How is a god molder doing this? I thought I'd seen everything. Oh, she's losing it. That didn't last long. Two minutes and thirty-nine seconds. That's how much she has in the tank. She collapses, wheezing. I stride away from the girl and to the Japanese and Rukwali woman, addressing both. If you're happy to wait a day for me to make necessary arrangements, I will be honored to accept this post, dependent on the answer to one very important question. Taken aback, the Rukwali woman asks, What's the question? I smile. What is your policy on pets? 